It's the aircraft that swept the South Pacific in World War II. The Hellcat may have been the Navy's single biggest contribution to victory in the Pacific. It renewed hope in America's Navy. The Hellcat is arguably one of the most successful fighters America ever built. And made hundreds of pilots fighting aces. It was unbelievable what you could do in the airplane. This is the inside story of how power and innovation changed the future of naval aviation. The Navy recognizes that they will need a much better plan. And created a legendary aircraft. Even today, the Hellcat still is a superlative fighter airplane. Meet the Navy's fiercest feline in the skies. The Hellcat is a beast. It showed the world what victory looks like. And it didn't need nine lives to do it. October 1944, the South Pacific. World War II rages on. The United States attacks the Philippine island of Leyte, cutting off Japanese access to vital oil supplies. In retaliation, Japanese leaders hatch a desperate plan, airstrikes against US forces. They set their sights on the USS Essex, one of the Navy's lead aircraft carriers. But the carrier is home to one of the most powerful fighters in the Pacific, the Hellcat. Agile, unshakable, and always ready for action, the Grumman F6F Hellcat is the US Navy's go-to fighter plane during the second half of World War II. The Hellcat was the perfect airplane for the time. Joseph Scheel restores and flies classic World War II aircraft. The Hellcat is a superlative fighter, very well built, extremely powerful, and highly maneuverable. The Hellcat always comes dressed for battle. Its cockpit is clad in 212 pounds of solid steel. It gives a lot of protection because of this huge piece of armor plate behind the pilot. And so any attack from within around 20 degrees of behind, this beautiful piece of steel will prevent the pilot, hopefully, from getting hit. The Hellcat also has the largest wing area of any World War II single-engine fighter. This makes the airplane a lot more stable. Pilots that talk about flying the Hellcat in comparison with other airplanes say the way that the airplane rolls and turns is on par with the best of the best. The Hellcat isn't just made to fight, it's made to win. In the South Pacific, World War II pilots are counting on it. October 24th, 1944, the Philippines. Captain David McCampbell and his Navy squadron have just completed a successful airstrike on a Japanese fleet. My grandfather was the commander of Air Group 15, which was uh, all the planes on the USS Essex, combination of bombers and fighters. Christopher McCampbell is the grandson of the late Captain David McCampbell. There was a, a large American task force just off the uh, north of Samar in the Philippines. That morning at dawn, they had led a major strike against the Japanese fleet. They were now preparing for a second strike on the ships. Bearing 273. A cry comes over the radio in the Essex's main control room. Coming on target, sir. Three groups of Japanese planes have been detected on radar. When the call comes in, the air wing of the Essex is not prepared. Dr. Rebecca Grant is one of the foremost civilian experts on Air Force history and aircraft. They've just recovered the morning sorties. The deck is covered with half-armed, half-fueled aircraft. None of the planes are ready for battle, but McCampbell and his wingman aren't going to let that stop them from getting into the fight. His plane was not fully fueled, but was pushed out onto the runway anyway, ready to go. So he and his wingman jumped in their planes and started the engines and took off. 22 miles away, a group of Japanese warplanes races towards the carrier. 
McCampbell and his wingman head straight for them, severely outnumbered. McCampbell knows he faces big odds. He already knows his main chance against this huge inbound formation is to get above them. McCampbell and his Hellcat fly with lethal force. Six 50 caliber machine guns. The Browning M2 machine gun is the standard uh, armament for any US fighter up until 1945. Six of them puts the airplane up around 2,500 rounds or so, giving that six to eight seconds of fire. The guns are set on an angle along the wing. When fired, the bullets converge at a single target point, almost three football fields away. As I'm looking through the gun sight, I can now see that I'm able to nail the guy. My 650 caliber machine guns are still going to converge and make that a very bad place to be for an enemy airplane. High above the Philippine Sea, Captain David McCampbell needs all the firepower he can get. His Hellcat races towards 60 unwavering Japanese warplanes, chief among them the much-feared Mitsubishi A6M Zero. This long-range fighter plane can reach a top speed of over 300 miles per hour. The Zero is one of the Imperial Japanese Navy's favorite weapons during World War II, responsible for 83% of American aircraft casualties in the first three months of battle in the Pacific. Japanese warplanes travel in formations of three, called shotais. This tactic triples their firepower. McCampbell must find a way to break them up and bring them down. My grandfather and his wingmen uh, came up with this tactic, and that was to climb as high as they could and then drop down and fire and pull back up. That was typical for this type of strike. High altitude is a huge advantage. It gives him a view over the Japanese formation. It guarantees he'll get the first shot, and it allows him to follow that formation if they break up and try to attack the carrier. McCampbell sets his sights on his first target, a zero on the outer edge of the formation. He and his wingman took the first strike, diving in towards the back of the formation. Grandfather took out one of the planes, and his wingman took out another. And then they climbed back up again to do a second run. But Campbell eyes his next target and hits it on the first try. He and his wingman coordinate attack after attack, breaking up the enemy formations. So at this point, I think my grandfather was pretty confident and knew he could take his time. So he turned off the oxygen in his cockpit, lit up a cigarette, studied the formations, studied the planes, was able to coordinate with his wingman, which they were going to go after. McCampbell is a force to be reckoned with. He's mastered the gunnery tactics, the slash and dive, that allows him to rack up multiple kills against Japanese aircraft on one mission. With each pass, another zero falls to McCampbell's gunfire. When his wingman radioed down to say that, that he was out of ammo and asked uh, whether or not they were going to stick around, Granddad radioed back and said, well, you want to follow me down, or do you want to stay up here and watch the show? I think he was pretty confident that he was going to do some damage. In less than an hour, McCampbell destroys nine enemy planes, a single-day American combat record that has never been matched. His wingman scores six. By the end of the mission, they had chased the enemy force about 100 miles away from the task force. David McCampbell and his nerves of steel have successfully thwarted a surprise Japanese airstrike of almost 60 warplanes. But his persistence has pushed his Hellcat to the breaking point. High above Leyte Gulf, McCampbell makes a harsh discovery. He's 100 miles away from the safety of the carrier's deck and flying on fumes. McCampbell looks at his fuel gauge. It's nearly zero. He and his wingman now face another emergency. If they don't make it back to the Essex, they'll ditch in the sea. 
They might survive the impact. An American destroyer or submarine might pick them up, but it's highly risky. McCampbell is flying back towards the last known position of the USS Essex. And as he gets close, he sees the most terrible sight. Planes line every inch of the carrier's deck. There is nowhere for McCampbell's Hellcat to land. And he realized that it would probably take about another 20 minutes for the, the deck to be emptied. And he just didn't have that much time. The crew directs McCampbell to land on another carrier nearby the USS Langley. He spots the USS Langley and begins to line up on final. And then he sees it. The Langley's deck is not ready to receive aircraft. McCampbell continues to circle. Each minute that passes poses even more danger. Time and fuel are quickly running out. October 1944, the South Pacific. Navy Captain David McCampbell and his F-6F Hellcat fly on fumes with nowhere to land. At the last possible minute, McCampbell gets the all clear from the USS Langley. His Hellcat sputters onto the carrier deck and just in time. So as soon as my grandfather pushed the throttle up, the engine died, and that's when he ran out of gas. Mechanics examine McCampbell's Hellcat and deliver some bone-chilling news. He talked to the mechanic that re-ammunitioned the guns. Uh, the mechanic told them that he had only about six rounds left, and all of them were jammed. And so my grandfather said, but it worked out OK. I think that really shows how cool he was and how confident he was in his plane to be able to make it back. McCampbell's bold moves and unwavering courage during the Battle of Leyte Gulf earn him the Medal of Honor, the nation's highest award for bravery. By the end of the war, he had 34 victories, which was most of any other naval pilot, making him the ace of aces. Two days after McCampbell's heroic actions, Allied forces clinch a victory at Leyte Gulf. It's a key win in the battle for the Pacific. The war will go on nearly another year. But at this point, Japan's Imperial Navy striking power is completely obliterated. The Hellcat's success is no accident. It's the result of a brilliant collaboration between engineers and the US Navy that started three years earlier. December 7th, 1941. The Imperial Japanese Navy launches a surprise military attack on Pearl Harbor. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. All eight battleships in the Pacific Fleet are destroyed or damaged. Until now, they've been the Navy's backbone. There's just one class of ship that didn't take a hit. By quirk of fate, the three US carriers in the Pacific Fleet are not there. Dr. Lawrence Burke is curator of US Naval Aviation at the National Air and Space Museum. The Navy is basically forced into a hard choice. The Navy can either use these carriers, or they can sit back and wait six to eight months until the battleship fleet is, is raised and repaired. And the Navy decides, no, we have to do something, and sends the carriers out by themselves. It's a risky move for the Navy. This new approach is untested in battle. The Navy never thought of its carriers as frontline offensive weapons. They had relied on the battleships because they had much bigger guns. Carriers have been in service for less than 20 years. The primary purpose of their aircraft has been to protect battleships from bombers. The question for the Navy was whether its newfangled carriers could bring enough striking power from the aircraft on their decks to destroy enemy ships. Now, 
the Navy must rely on the muscle of these unproven fighter planes. Chief among them, the Grumman F4F Wildcat. Tough, resilient, and innovative, the Wildcat ushers in a new era of capability for American carrier-based fighter planes. Its engineer, a former Navy pilot named Leroy Grumman. The concept for the Wildcat begins in 1935, when the US Navy begins development of a monoplane aircraft. Until now, the Navy's fighters have been biplanes, with one wing stacked on top of another. A monoplane will be a radical change. The Navy knows it needs the monoplane fighter designs. They have better speed, better dive, they're better tactically, and they can carry heavier armaments. Two companies, Grumman and the Brewster Corporation, agreed to design prototypes. In 1939, Grumman's F4F2 and the Brewster's F2A Buffalo square off to see who will be the Navy's first monoplane aircraft. Grumman's plane is faster, the Buffalo more maneuverable. The Navy declares the Buffalo the right one for the job. At the same time, the Navy is reluctant to have only one fighter source. So they ask Grumman to continue improving the F4F2. Grumman continues work and makes a lot of improvements in his fighter. A new engine, more wing area, better guns, and the Navy likes what they see. Navy tests confirm it. Grumman's new F4F3 is superior to the Brewster Buffalo. They decide to buy some of Grumman's new fighter and ultimately christen it the Wildcat. Grumman knows that space on the flight deck is tight. His patented folding stow wing design allows the Navy to double the amount of Wildcats it can fit on each carrier. Leroy Grumman had figured it out just by playing with a simple piece of eraser. And he figured that out by cutting it at a 45 degree angle at the front one way and a 45 degree angle at the back a different way and just hinging it with this diagonal pin. Very simple, elegant design. In August 1940, the British become the first to test the Wildcat in combat. They've been at war with Germany for almost a year, flying the plane under a very different name. The British Royal Navy calls them the Martlet. The Royal Navy is using their F4F Martlets up in the North Sea. They are using them to protect the convoys to Russia. They're defending the convoys against bomber aircraft and in particular against the big reconnaissance aircraft that are spotting for the German U-boats, which are the real danger up there. After Pearl Harbor, as the United States enters World War II, the Navy is far from ready. It must put its faith in its carriers and their untested aircraft. The entire Pacific theater is at stake. The Wildcat gets its baptism of fire the day after Pearl Harbor. December 8th, 1941, Wake Island almost 2,500 miles west of Hawaii. U.S. soldiers keep watch over an airstrip made for American bombers. The Wake Island bomber strip is a huge threat to Japan. B-17 bombers can patrol out over the Pacific, watching the movements of the fleet and attacking Japanese ships. The Japanese have to take it. Just hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor, 36 Japanese bombers approach Wake Island. They destroy 12 US planes on the ground, but don't realize that there are four Wildcats still at large. The Marine Fighter Squadron on Wake doesn't have a lot of early warning of incoming raids, so the squadron commander is keeping four of the 16 planes airborne on combat air patrol at any given time. The four Wildcats return to a severely damaged American outpost. They are the only aircraft to survive the attack. 
three days later, the Japanese come back to finish the job. On December 11th, the Japanese show up with an invasion force, and they think the invasion will be easy. The four remaining Wildcats launch a stiff defense, taking out two Japanese cruisers and a destroyer. The Marines use their four operational Wildcats to hold off the initial invasion force. They make it so tricky for Japan that Japan has to retreat um, from Wake Island. The United States breathes a sigh of relief. But two weeks later, the Wildcat meets its match. The Japanese come back with a full-on invasion, including their carriers. And this is the first time the Wildcat encounters the Zero in combat. Quick, merciless, deadly. The Mitsubishi A6M Zero is Japan's premier dogfighting plane. The Zero is a much faster plane. It's small and light, and quite literally can fly circles around the Wildcats. A fully loaded Zero weighs almost 2,000 pounds less than a Wildcat, making it an agile, maneuverable dogfighter. Now, it attacks the Wildcats mercilessly and takes out the last four planes in the squadron. By mid-afternoon, US forces surrender Wake Island to Japan. It's a bitter defeat for the US Navy. It's clear the Wildcat is outclassed in almost every category. And the Navy comes back and asks Grumman to basically build a better Wildcat. Grumman's first move, meet with the pilots who have fought the Zero in battle. Grumman's engineers work directly with Navy pilots to get the latest intelligence on Japanese capabilities and roll all that back into the design. Their advice, mount the cockpit higher in the fuselage, giving pilots better visibility over the aircraft's wings. Another must, a more powerful engine. To accommodate it, Grumman must redesign and strengthen the new plane's frame. In America, Grumman races to build this new fighter. Across the Pacific, the Zero helps the Japanese gain more ground. The Navy is desperate for a way to counter the Japanese fighter they soon capture something to help them, a crash-landed enemy plane. July 1942, Akutan Island, Alaska Territory. The Americans make an incredible discovery. A fully intact A6M Zero, crash-landed and abandoned by the Japanese. It's just what the Navy needs. The military is finally able to get a good close look at the airplane. They put their best minds on the job, analyzing every single inch of the elusive enemy plane. Through rebuilding it and test flying it, they find sort of all the weaknesses of the aircraft. It was a gold mine for Navy tactics. By flying it, they showed that the engine could cut out in a dive and that the Zero was very sluggish when the pilot tried to roll to the right. It allowed Navy flyers to develop some super defensive tactics against the Zero. The Akutan Zero spills its secrets easily. But even before it was discovered, fighter pilots were testing new tactics to win in battle. One of the best known is the Thatch Weave, developed by Lieutenant Commander Jimmy Thatch. He developed the Thatch Weave sitting at his kitchen table and using matchsticks. The Thatch Weave relied on a teamwork concept to develop a tactic that could beat the Zero in a dogfight. Wildcats work in pairs, weaving their flight paths around an enemy plane. 
the Zero is forced to focus on one Wildcat, leaving it open to attack from the second. The technique gets its first trial in June 1942, when the United States delivers a surprise blow to the Japanese Navy at the Battle of Midway. It's a victory for the Wildcat, but a small leap forward in the bigger Pacific War. Even though the US was victorious at Midway and held back the Japanese advance, there was a long way to go. Japan was still in control of the Pacific. Japan still had an immense Imperial Navy. As World War II rages on, the clock is ticking for Grumman to develop a better fighter. Halfway around the globe, Wildcat pilots must hold their own against another enemy. The Germans. October 4th, 1943, Orkney Islands, Scotland. A squadron of Navy Wildcats works alongside British forces aboard the USS Ranger, a carrier designed to protect the North Sea. We patrol up and down the coast looking for German shipping. Commander Dean Diz Laird was a Wildcat pilot with a VF-4 squadron on the USS Ranger. We did most of our operations over along the Norwegian coast, up inside the Arctic Circle. Germany occupies Norway, capitalizing on its rich supply of iron. Allied forces want to cut off German shipping routes, depriving the Nazis of much needed war supplies. It was one day in October, we were flying a combat air patrol. Our radar people on the ship picked up a target. Vector 045, go out. Laird and three other Wildcat pilots race into action, anxious to see if they're under threat from a German plane. We got out there and we looked and looked and looked and there were so many claws, we, we just never could find this target. The ship orders the Wildcats back to the carrier. But Laird has a suspicion. A cloudy sky is the perfect place for an enemy to hide. We knew that radar controller was good, and if he said there was a target out there, there was one. I decided I was going to keep a lookout back there. And sure enough, up from behind a huge cloud, here came this strange airplane. Laird finds himself facing a Junkers Ju-88 fighter bomber, equipped with twin machine guns and a three-ton bomb load. It's one of the Luftwaffe's most destructive forces. Laird quickly radios his wingman a warning. Tally ho. And I called tally ho, bogey, six o'clock. The Junkers spies the Wildcats and speeds off in the other direction. Laird guns his Wildcat forward in pursuit. The hunt is on. The German bomber is quick. Laird must think fast to outsmart the enemy plane. In combat, you've got two things that can be at your advantage, speed and altitude. And you never give up one without gaining some on the other. Laird climbs his plane higher into the air setting his sights on the most vulnerable part of his enemy's body. I usually look at the airplane and then try to decide where the fuel tanks might be located. That's the part I usually aim for. As Laird drops down to make a run, he's met with oncoming fire. Bullets beat close to the Wildcat's own fuel tank, but Laird pays no mind. The Wildcat can take a direct hit the reason, a self-sealing fuel tank. It's one of the fighter plane's best defenses. If the tank is pierced by gunfire, a layer of untreated natural rubber swells up, closing off the hole around the bullet. A self-sealing fuel tank is a lifesaver for the pilot. The plane can take a little battle damage without bursting into flame. High above the waters of the North Sea, Commander Diz Laird prepares to make a second run on an enemy plane. 
he dives his wildcat down upon the bomber and unloads a shower of bullets. I couldn't tell whether I was hitting him or not. I kept shooting. And this airplane exploded in a big ball of fire. But there is no time for celebration. A call comes over the radio. Another target has been spotted on radar. Laird pushes his wildcat onward, straight into a curtain of thick clouds. I dropped down to or just a few feet off the water so that I could maintain some visual reference. The visibility was extremely low. Suddenly, I see this airplane. He was coming right at me. Laird gets his first real look at this new enemy as it rushes towards him head on. What he sees will stick with him forever. October 4th, 1943, Orkney Island, Scotland. Commander Dean Diz Laird flies his Wildcat through the clouds when he encounters an enemy plane, a Heinkel HE 115. This German float plane delivers destruction by both land and sea. Two large stabilizing floats allow it to land on water. It carries out surprise torpedo bombings for the Luftwaffe. My reaction time was instinctive. I pulled up and pulled the trigger, hoping to hit his port engine. Saw my bullets hit his, his float there. Well, the float almost completely disintegrated. There were pieces of it just flying all over. The wounded Heinkel attempts to make a sea landing on its floats. He dropped down to, to the water, tried to land, and that port float that I had blasted in the first run just collapsed. The left wing dropped, hit the water, and he cartwheeled. First the Junkers, and now the Heinkel. That's two Luftwaffe planes destroyed in one day. Commander Laird goes on to become the only Navy fighter ace to score victories in both the European and Pacific theaters. I know I felt very comfortable on it. Wildcat, just a very rugged piece of material that was almost indestructible. While the Wildcats try to hold their own in the war, the race is on for a powerful new fighter plane. Throughout early 1942, Leroy Grumman works closely with the Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics to develop a new aircraft. Grumman steps up modifications on his new fighter to make it superior and able to take on the Zero. The first prototype flies on June 26, 1942 but it doesn't get its name until almost 13 months later. Grumman wanted to name his new fighter the Tomcat, but it was a little too risque for the 1940s. So he said, take out the sexy, put in the profanity, and we'll call it the Hellcat. At its heart, a powerful engine, the Pratt & Whitney R2800 Double Wasp. Its twin row 18 cylinder design produces 2,000 horsepower. The R2800 engine allowed the United States to build an airplane that was like no other. This engine had the highest horsepower per weight of any engine of the time. Introduced in 1939, the R2800 is already proving its capabilities in other US aircraft, including the P 47 Thunderbolt and the B-26 Marauder. The Pratt & Whitney Double Wasp was a superior fighter engine, far in advance of anything previously seen. Its secret weapon, a supercharger. It's an air compressor that helps the engine burn more fuel, dramatically increasing speed and power. It's going to give Grumman's new fighter 25% better power and performance. That's going to allow the Hellcat to get more speed over the Zero and also to be faster in a dive.
fighter design, especially when we get to engines, becomes almost the difference of very slight percentages. The R2800 engine was about three or 400 horsepower more powerful. That small difference meant that this Hellcat would exceed zero performance by just a few percent. But in fighting airplanes, one versus another, it doesn't matter if you have two A players in the game. The survivor is the one that gets 97 versus the loser getting 95% of the horsepower. The Hellcat isn't the only aircraft designed around the R2800 engine. There's another powerful aircraft vying for the Navy's attention, the Vought F4U Corsair. It has one major advantage over the Hellcat, speed. Pushed to its limit, the F4U Corsair can fly over 400 miles per hour. But the plane has a complicated design, and carrier landings prove to be dangerous. Corsair was a fast, beautiful fighter, but it had so many accidents when it began carrier trials that the Navy made a decision. The Navy gives the Corsair to land-based Marine squadrons, and the Hellcat develops as the main carrier-based fighter for the war. By March 1943, the first wave of Hellcats is on its way to the South Pacific. The Hellcat was designed to be easy to fly and easy to build. Grumman ramped up production quickly and was soon churning out thousands of Hellcats per month. The Navy recognized that, yes, this was going to be a great plane. It's recognized basically from this first experimental flight that we immediately need to start building lots and lots of these. By December 1943, over 2,500 Hellcats are in Navy hands. The Navy's need was great. Grumman had to produce the Hellcat fast in order to make sure we didn't lose the war in the Pacific. The plane soon gets a nickname, the Goldilocks Fighter. Its easy operation makes it just right for young Navy pilots. It's an easy transition for a Wildcat pilot to come directly into this airplane and fly it well. There's one multi-ace. He loved that Hellcat enough that he, he once made the statement that if that Hellcat could cook, I'd marry it. With their new plane, Navy pilots are determined to strengthen their muscle in the Pacific. June 19, 1944, Guam. A Hellcat squadron launches a surprise attack on a Japanese air base. As I recall, it was, it was quite a busy day. Lieutenant Commander Fred Buck Duncan was a Hellcat fighter race in the South Pacific. Well, we were escorting uh, bombers over the airfield at Guam. Duncan's strike is successful knocking out a portion of the enemy's vital supplies and aircraft. Most of the squadron heads back to their carrier. Dungan and his wingman linger behind. I had seen some airplanes parked under the palm trees, and I wanted to take a picture so our battleships could come in and destroy these airplanes. Dungan dives in snapping away from the safety of his cockpit. Suddenly, he spies something unusual. I saw these airplanes coming in, breaking up into a landing pattern. I thought it was our group looking over their damage they had just done, but it wasn't. Straight ahead, a fresh squadron of enemy planes hell-bent on revenge. Among them, the Hellcat's chief Pacific rifle, the Japanese Mitsubishi A6M-0. I screamed into my microphone, pilots, come back. My wingman and I have an air group surrounded. We need help. Dungan and his wingman are alone, staring down a wall of 40 Japanese aircraft. I knew my buddies were just, just seconds in back of me. 
So I dove down into that air group. He plunges his Hellcat into the formation of enemy planes. You don't think of your own safety. All you do is think of opportunities, opportunity to shoot. Dungan's quick nosedive catches the enemy off guard. He singles out one zero. I made a pass at him and blew him up. I shot him down, and I think I destroyed the one in back of him also. Two down, more than three dozen to go. Dungan evades enemy fire, diving below the zero formation once more. It's a risky move. There's not much maneuverability underneath. There's not much space. You can get trapped. But one airplane down there, one can do all kinds of different things. As Dungan prepares for his next pass, backup arrives. A squadron of Hellcats has answered his battle cry. They barrel down on the enemy planes. Then the formation landing broke up and uh, went in all different directions. Got back in one fellow, had him all lined up in my, in my sights and pulled the trigger. And he moved like this. He knew, then I knew, that he had experience. He's dictating the conditions of this dogfight. I'm going to change this. This is the moment the Hellcat has been built for, a chance to prove itself in a head-to-head -head battle with the Zero. June 19th, 1944. High over Guam, Commander Fred Buck Duncan and his F-6F Hellcat battle a Japanese Zero. When you're paired off in a dogfight, it's a lot like boxing in a ring. You're anticipating where the enemy is going to end up. You know your airplane, and you know the limitations. You know how far you can push that plane before it stops flying. And you, and you get to that spot very often. Dungan could outrun his enemy, but he decides to take a different approach, slowing his Hellcat down as he makes his next pass. The slowness seemed to confuse the enemy very much. You feel like a sitting duck when you pull your throttle back in a dogfight, but you're not because you're, you're getting your airplane speed down to maneuverability where you could spin it on a dime. Losing speed is a risky tactic. Dungan hopes it will throw his enemy off guard. A lot of strategy in dogfighting, a lot of faking, bluffing. Then you finally get the guy in your, in your sights, and, and you've got him. Dungan has only a split second to fire. He makes it count, hitting the Zero and its pilot full on. His plane stopped flying and uh, maneuvering and um, headed for the water, and I went right, right beside him. I chopped my throttle and, and alongside of him, and he turned and looked at me. And we'd been at each other for a while, and we recognized each other. And he saluted me and went in the water. That day, Lieutenant Commander Dungan's Hellcat squadron destroys all 40 Japanese aircraft. For his bravery, he is awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. It was unbelievable what you could do in the airplane. We decimated the enemy uh, air force. Dungan's dogfight marks day one of the Battle of the Philippine Sea, the last major carrier-to-carrier -carrier duel of World War II. The next 48 hours see Hellcats engaged in relentless aerial combat. At the Battle of the Philippine Sea, the Hellcat proved that it was the master of the skies. Japan lost over 300 aircraft, and with that loss, ended the ability of Japan's carriers to become an effective offensive striking force. 
The U.S. just shoots down Japanese planes with incredible ease. One of the pilots, after a day's worth of combat, makes the comment that, oh, it's just like an old-time turkey shoot. And that becomes the nickname. It becomes known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. The Hellcat continues to fight until the final days of the war. One of the interesting things about the Hellcat, it may actually have dropped the last bombs of the war. There's a, a fighter bomber squadron that was over Japan. The leader had just dropped his bombs in a dive and was pulling out when they heard the radio call to cease all attacks. The Japanese have surrendered. On August 15, 1945, one week after the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Japanese surrender. At the end of the war, Grumman is still producing Hellcats, but there is no longer any need. The last batch rolls out in November 1945. The Hellcat was phased out of frontline duties very shortly after World War II ended. This was really a warbird, suited to take on the striking air arm of Japan's Imperial Navy. Once Japan's Imperial Navy was defeated, the Hellcat's job was done. The Navy turns its attention towards a new technology, the jet engine. The Hellcat is given another assignment, headlining a newly formed flight demonstration team. June 15, 1946. Jacksonville, Florida. Three Hellcats perform a 15-minute aerial acrobatic show for the public. It's the very first performance of the team known as the Blue Angels, a tradition that continues with different aircraft to this day. The Blue Angels naturally picked the top fighter of the war, the Hellcat. It was the Hellcat that reminded everyone what the Navy carriers had done in winning World War II. The Grumman Corporation continues to manufacture a line of CAT aircraft up until 1991. The Bearcat, Panther, Tiger, and Tomcat are built in the Grumman tradition of reliability and ruggedness. I think Grumman design philosophy lives on. The Grumman aircraft had a reputation for being able to take a lot of damage and still make it back. It made you feel like they were doing everything they could to bring you back so you could fly again. And that made you feel good. In just over two years, Grumman produced more than 12,000 Hellcats, only 270 were lost in combat. Today, less than two dozen remain. Flying Hellcats are the rarest birds of all. The Hellcat was scrapped so quickly after World War II that Hellcats today are very rare. If you've got a Hellcat and you can restore it to flying status, that's an incredibly special contribution to aviation history. 2017. Chino, California. The Yanks Air Museum works to restore a noted F6F Hellcat to its 1943 airworthy condition. The restoration has been ongoing for approximately seven to eight years. A special bureau number inside the cockpit tells a colorful backstory. This Hellcat belonged to Commander Alex Brashew, a fighter ace with 19 air victories. Seven of those happened in this plane. It is very unique not only to have a, a combat aircraft that served in the war, but one flown by a very notable, very famous and successful American ace. Mechanics rely on a series of original 1943 blueprints to help them assemble the plane. We do have the original blueprints on microfilm for probably maybe about 70 to 80% of the aircraft. When parts are missing, it becomes a historical scavenger hunt. And we have gone as far as the South Pacific occasionally uh, to find certain rare parts to, for some of our restorations. Uh, it's really quite amazing what you'll find. Yanks Air Museum wants the restored Hellcat fighter to inspire a new generation of aircraft enthusiasts. 
it's really that dedication to trying to, you know, keep this history alive and preserve it that keeps our team going. Uh, ultimately, it really is more a labor of love than anything else. The hard-won battles of the Pacific Theater are long over. But the Hellcat's ruggedness, dexterity, and sheer firepower still shines on. The Hellcat's air-to-air -air kill ratio was one of the highest of World War II, 19 to 1. It was a purpose-built aircraft to do one thing, and it did that thing very, very well. It gave the enemy hell, the fighter pilots hope, and the United States the victory it badly needed. If we hadn't had the helicopter, the war might have had a different outcome. In just over two years, the Hellcat proved that U.S. naval aviation was a force to be reckoned with and left its name etched in the history books as one of World War II's most legendary fighters.